like how there's interconnectedness and how there's relationships between all the different plants that you're putting in the ground and how they all have different functions. Some bring nitrogen, some bring other nutrients, um, and how they're all just interlocking. But really, so it's, okay. all right, so say like a disturbed piece of soil. We could even plant this while we talk about it. Um, you got a disturbed piece of soil after whatever happened, or a big, uh, what do we got, a hurricane or an earthquake, and it just trees fell over, and it turned up the soil, and wow. something's got to go there. Um, the soils are, are part of the ecosystem that you're working with, and they provide the foundation for um, everything else. And if you put a plant into a soil that it's not compatible with, it's not going to grow. So, so some seed comes in from the nettle, and I didn't dig a big hole, and there's a Look lot of roots hole. here. Oh my god! Edible forest gardening's been going on um, at various levels for many, many, many years, hundreds of years, maybe even thousands. Um, there's a root down there. I got a stick. We don't want to tear, I don't want to hurt the roots or like kill anything. In the Pacific Northwest, um, Native Americans also um, tended the wild. They they had these spaces and, and they pruned trees or shrubs so that they would produce the highest yield of berries. Um, burned areas like the prairies, they um, burned the prairies to uh, keep out like Douglas fir so that they're more um, useful plant species, especially like camas, would grow and proliferate there. Um, so that's kind of a form of forest gardening. So it comes in and uh, it propagates itself in that place and it shades the soil. So then you don't have all this water going up into the air. It keeps the water and the hydration intact. It shades the soil so it's kind of protecting things with its little roots. Then anything can come in but they won't take over everything normally as far as I know. And I mean, you don't really mind if they do because they're so high in nutrients and minerals. Um, super high in iron and calcium and whatever else. And they're good for uh, circulation if you get stung and it's good for, you know, a lot of stuff. I, it would take a long list to say everything. Very good in soup. Good in soup. And we had it in soup last night. Very good in soup. We had it in soup last night. <laughs> and then, I don't know. Got to study more to really know what happens next. Another thing I really like about forest gardening is it's this it's this place where like art and like these kind of beautiful ideas and like you know save the world sort of ideas and then the science behind them can meet. And so there's all this science and forest ecology, um, you know, literature that's referenced and all this like you know agroecological literature too that edible forest gardening is based on. And so I like seeing that these ideas are rooted, rooted <laughs> in real studies that have been done and I can access those specific things. On April 11th, um, a Saturday, we coordinated um, a day to have the campus community and wider community um, come out to volunteer and put more plants in the ground and finish off putting in the garden space. Well, I don't have a, much experience with gardening and I think it's a really awesome idea to put an edible forest garden out here. And just wanted to get my hands on the dirt. And while well, I'm wearing gloves, I should probably take them off. <laughs> There were people who live both on and off campus coming here for a single purpose and meeting each other and getting to work together. And you know, if I don't work to save it and make sure they do, not a lot of other people will. So that's my matter. You know, getting their creative juices flowing and you know, learning about the the things that they were putting in the ground. I planted some akebia earlier, and when you get, you know. When you get up close and personal with all these plants, it's kind of mind-boggling how green, how different varieties of green there are in the leaves of everything. 
It's like this one is lime green, but a kibia was more like, I don't even know. It's crazy. It's like when you spend time with something up close, all of a sudden you really start to get the, get the gist of it a little more. Like, I don't even know the name of this guy, but the root system was so much more fragile than the others. Planting a kibia was cake, and these roots were like, <laughs> up in the air. So, yeah, I like variety. I grew up uh, in the city of Chicago, pretty much inner city, so I didn't have a lot of exposure to nature really my whole life. And growing up in the city, there's a really big disconnect kind of between, you know, where your food comes from and how it's produced, what it means to be outside, what a forest is, what a tree is, you know. My image of food was what you bought from the supermarket, you know, pre-packaged, plastic, by the pound, you know, they see where my food came from and so I didn't really understand the impact of my decisions and, you know, I didn't even realize my decisions had specific impacts that far ranging. I think that getting to know the person that grows your food is really the only way that you can be sure that you're getting good food um, or raising it yourself, but a lot of people don't have time to do that. Well, and if anything, I know people who just kind of follow the microwave dinner and the sit in front of the TV thing just because it's easier. And um, I think, you know, just there's a lot of things really disconnecting us, you know, just not even cooking our own food, cutting it up, feeling it, smelling it, seeing where it comes from. Just, there's a lot more convenience. Small farms have been growing by 10,000 new farms a year. So it's more and more available as time goes on to meet a farmer and know where your food comes from and know that you're getting getting good stuff, even if they're not certified organic, knowing that they don't use a heavy amount of pesticides is, is a good thing to know. They'll just never get to share it, which is why, you know, I'm, I'm all about things like this, you know, trying to help people just live richer lives and understand the importance of their decisions. I think a lot of people are really interested in sustainability because it just flat out makes sense and it's obviously um, the umbrella solution to combating all of these huge challenges that we're running into. There's a lot of power in kind of seeing all these different things as just facets of the same problem, social, you know, economic, environmental, political. They're not different things to be categorized and fixed. With climate change and, you know, food security and um, all the pollution and stuff, you know, sustainability kind of gives us a way of thinking about how to reduce waste, how to think about where things come from, how to work together to kind of make these changes. Um, of course, you, you get more specified as you get into it. Some people go into food, some people go into waste, you know, some people go into water or air. I mean, everything needs a little bit more attention and um, I think especially at Evergreen, a lot of people are looking for for solutions, for ways that we can actually not only learn about what awful things are going on, but then also to to make change and to, to try and fix all this stuff. You know, we've got, I mean, you have to, and, and we know, and we can know how, and we're, you know, it's just, it's just about experimenting and learning more about sustainability and how we can all work together on it. So it's cool to learn that and then hopefully go back to where, where I'm from and figure out how to translate that my bioregion. So, that's, that's my definition of the edible forest garden as of today. But I'm sure it's going to change as uh, you know time passes. 